Design Talk Live is brought to you by Allison Eden Studios. Design custom stained glass, mirror, and mosaic tiles for hospitality, commercial, and residential design projects. Explore the limitless possibilities with Allison's wallpaper, fabric options, and custom accessories. To learn more, click the link in the description below. This episode is also brought to you by the Capital One Venture Card. Earn unlimited 1.25 times miles with zero annual fee. Earn miles on every purchase, plus additional miles on hotels and rental cars booked through Capital One Travel. Apply online for Venture One by clicking the link below. This episode is also brought to you by Join In Crowd Digital Contact Cards. Create your free contact card in under a minute and start making more friends, growing your network, and staying connected. Join the In Crowd today. This episode was also made possible through the generous support of Serena Martin and the 24 7 Creative Agency. Whether you are an individual or a company, we deliver creative marketing strategies 24 7 in order to connect, partner, and develop exceptional brand experiences. To learn more, click the link below. Discover their unique brand marketing solutions 24 7. I love working with designers and I feel like I can honestly say they really enjoy working with me as well because not only am I passionate about what I do, but I realize how busy designers are and how valuable my services can be for them in specifying art for their clients. Uh, working with an art consultant, the benefit of that is it's kind of one-stop shopping where art consultants have access to everything from galleries to print houses to auctions, you know, you name it. So when a client goes to a designer and says, we would love to have, you know, art as part of this either renovation or build or, or whatever the project is, um, a designer does not have time to go spec art. Even if they love doing it, it's just so time consuming and such a huge add on to what they're already doing. So the benefit of working with an art consultant, especially a good one, is that they do all the work for you. You know, so many times I'll get an email from a designer saying, I have a new project, here are the specs, create a presentation for me. And I love doing that because it's somebody handing me this kind of palette to fill in. And it's just so much fun for me. You know, all I need to know is kind of the aesthetic they're going for. Um, the more information they give me, the better I can serve them. You know, I mean, I'll get everything from photographs of furniture and fabric swatches, paint chips. Um, of course, important things like wall sizes, what the client likes, does not like. And, you know, it's interesting because people more often know what they don't like more than what they actually do like. So I come in with all of that. I learn about budgets. I learn about, you know, the, what kind of lifestyle the client has, what they really want. Um, if they are a collector or are they beginning collectors? And then we just kind of go from there. From Spotify, Design Talk Live Studios, Joseph Hecker Inc., and the Live Broadcast Network, this is the Design Talk Live podcast, the podcast that explores the topics and conversations that matter to the design community. Here's your host, Joseph Hecker. Hey there, design peeps. I'm super excited about this episode. Uh, James and I have been connected on social media. We like each other's posts for quite a while now. Uh, he's in one of my favorite places, Palm Springs. I have a, a, 
a, a long time history with Palm Springs. Uh, my parents have a resort out there. And so we spent all of our Thanksgivings and holidays out in Palm Springs. So, and then, and then if you haven't been modernism week, you've got to come out for uh modern modernism week out in Palm Springs. It is such a blast and you get to meet all the who's who and and just so much fun james thank you so much for for being on the show and i can't wait to dive into one of my first loves art so thanks for being on well thank you joseph it's so great to be here after connecting with you for so many years here we are i love that yeah. Now, for our listeners, can you share kind of a, a, an overview overview of you and your company, and uh, and that you're out in Palm Springs and off air? You were sharing a little bit about the the gallery where you're at. So, can you um, yeah, a little overview about you and your company? Sure. Um, I relocated to Palm Springs a little over two years ago from San Francisco after having a gallery there for more than 25 years. And I think the pandemic was the catalyst for everything, all this change. And as I always say, there's an upside to everything. And my life here in Palm Springs was the upside to the pandemic. I opened a space here called James Bocce Contemporary and my tagline for my business is art consultant, curator, collaborator. And those are my three hats that I kind of flip on and off. And I opened this space in a really unique environment called the Shops at 1345, which are located on Palm Canyon right in the design district of Palm Springs, which is the north side. This um, concept uh, was created by Brandon Hoskins and Stephen Wilson about 11 years ago. They are designers, they are retailers, they are like wizards in the retail industry. So they came up with this concept and created 14 individual shops, which are um, tremendously well vetted. I really had to politic to get in there. And um, I was just ready to give up on it. And then it happened, which I was thrilled by. And the beauty of the concept they created is that while they love these shop owners to be there, they have in-house salespeople. So you really don't have to be there. And that's kind of what I was looking for because at this stage, after having galleries since the mid eighties, the last thing I wanted to be doing in Palm Springs was babysitting a gallery. So the crazy thing is I find myself going there a couple of hours every day because of the people that I meet. I mean, designers from all over the world walk in there. A couple of weeks ago, Diane Keaton walked in and walked into the gallery. And it was just really funny. I said, can we take a photograph together? And she was with a friend and the friend said, oh, I'll do it. I'll do it. And right as she's about to take the photograph of us, I said to Diane, I love you. And she said, that's going to get you in trouble. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, I just have such a great time there. Palm Springs, a a little history. So uh, that people might not know um, back in, in the boom of the film industry, Paramount studios and uh, the back lots and all this stuff. A lot of the actors, and this is like your Clark Gables and your, a lot of the actors, by contract had to be within two hours of the studio right. and Palm Springs was the furthest that they could go uh, <laughs> and, and, and not yes. be in the ocean. <laughs> right. And, uh, and so it became this little retreat spot where so many celebrities, Bob Hope and uh, oh, yeah. had spots out there and they could kind of just enjoy and the weather was good and, and so, and it's, it's really lasted and it had its 
it's mob ties and all kinds of cool stuff. So. Oh, yeah, it's just kind of crazy. I mean, right behind where um, my space is was one of Liberace's houses. And wow. it's just, um, <laughs> it's just like so funny. You know, the house itself is this white mid century house, but yet it has these Greek columns and statues out in front of it. And, um, you know, to tie it all in, I represent this artist, Lucky Rap, whose work is all text based. And she just recently did this piece. And it's this shiny, shiny resin, 10 pores of resin on canvas, black, and has gold lettering on it that says, fabulous like Liberace. Wow. So yeah. it's just, yeah. I mean, the cool thing that's happening here right now is there's all this amazing history, but then there's all this newness. Um. Palm Springs has now become this real foodie town. And yeah. there's all these really cool little boutique hotels opening up. Uh, the Webster just opened here. And so there's like this really cool tug between history and future. How fun. And and then and then just the people that pop in. I mean, uh, uh I was at uh, uh, an event at Dinah Shore's old house, and uh -huh. um, and had I been cognizant of it, uh, Barack Obama was over in the tennis courts. <laughs> <laughs> How wonderful! So you never know who you're going to run into, and then you've got like Coachella, and it's really a spot where so many people just come out and golf and. And, and oh, yeah. you shop art. So you're in the, a great spot. Yeah, um, I, I'm blessed. <laughs> so did you get your uh, art? How did you get involved with art? Way back in the day, in the mid 80s, um, with a friend of mine who also had a real passion for art, we started, we were the first people to actually do this. We did... We curated art shows in nightclubs. So we did the first art show at Limelight. We did shows at the Palladium, um, every club you could think of. And I guess my favorite out of all of them was a place called the Area, which was down in Tribeca. And what was unique about Area was I don't know what it originally was, but when you walked into the entrance of it, you walked down this super wide hallway. And on each side of this hallway were, for lack of a better description, what looked like department store windows. Oh, and wow. their, yeah. And their whole trip was when people entered the building, there was something going on. In, every one of these windows before you even got into the club. So it ranged from an art exhibit in one window to, you know, performance art in another window to a light show, you name it. It was all about like just pure visual entertainment. How fun. How fun. Yeah. I love the mixture of art and music. Um, I, I, I got I cut my teeth in uh, custom lighting for hotels and casinos. Oh, wow. um, and then I went into tech and in tech, I would say that, well, and I've said this on a, on a past episode, um, the design industry could really benefit from learning more of those business skills from like the tech side of things. And, yeah. and, and then I think art, uh, I mean, not our interior design and tech, could all benefit from more music appreciation, uh, um, the arts, the arts and entertainment, and, and a fusion because it, it's just so inspirational. It, it expands the mind. It introduces new thought concepts. It gets people thinking in a different way. Yeah. Well, back then, I mean, I have to say that the art scene couldn't have been any more tied into 
the club scene than, you know. I mean, I remember when Palladium opened, they gave spaces in the club to individual artists. Like Kenny Scharf did a bathroom. Keith Haring did a bathroom. Sandra Chia did these unbelievable like reliefs on the ceiling. So it was just so like tied in. You know, there'd be a gallery opening and then there'd be a post gallery opening at a club. Wow. And it was just, it was, it was a blast. I mean, you know, people always say things come back. That was a time that I know will never come back. Yeah, I mean, uh, years ago, and I was talking with um, uh, James, uh, not James, that was uh, the tech. Um, Oh, um, he, uh, the owner of crown, uh, James Packer, James Packer and Adam Glickman. And we were talking about doing a, uh, a hotel concept and, and we called it a concept hotel. Uh, we were looking for a B tier property in a major metropolitan where every third room would be by a different artist, a different designer, a different influencer. So mm-hmm. you might be in the um banksy rooms or you could be in the you know like i don't know some some influence maybe a miley cyrus room or something like you but you could kind of stay in all of them and you could collect them all type of thing so that was someone just did that here oh yeah Someone, someone opened a space here called the velvet rope okay and it's a designer i want to say his name is robert diaz but don't hold me to that. But there's like a Lucille ballroom. Um, each room has a complete, there's a Liberace room. Each room has a completely different theme going on, but somehow reflecting like that whole modernism period. Wow. And they wow. just opened like a week ago. And I love the name, the Velvet Rope. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, um, so, 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 um, uh, uh, now you kind of before Palm Springs, you were out in San Francisco. How, uh, yes. what was San Francisco like? What was your wh- how were you tied into the art scene? And then what brought you out to Palm Springs? Um, San Francisco, I left New York where I had a gallery for many years, first in the East Village and then in Soho. Left there in '93 when the art market just like crashed and galleries were like closing in droves and um i just thought this is a perfect time to i guess i always make big moves when major things are going on <laughs> so i went to, to san francisco <laughs> yeah and a me- two days after i was here i had a job directing a gallery and Then at the second gallery I was working at, I met this great woman, Annette Schutz, an art consultant, and her and I decided to open a gallery. And we had this gallery called Art House for 25 years. Uh, It was nominated best gallery in San Francisco, like for three years running. And we did a lot of great things and worked with some amazing artists and then the pandemic, and then it was time to, you know, San Francisco has been hit so hard by the pandemic and it's um, recovery is so slow. Mm -hmm. It's still really, uh, it's so sad. I was just there because I curated, not curated, I was a juror for this amazing show called Black and White. And it's still on through the 16th at ARC Gallery in San Francisco. And they received over 1,100 submissions of work in every media you can imagine. But the criteria had to be it was black and white. Wow. And so I got to choose like maybe 75 pieces out of the 1,100. And they mounted a show. And I got to go to the opening a couple of weeks ago, and it was like 
it, it was so amazing to walk into a big gallery space and everything in there be black and white. You know, the, no color. The only color were the people who were in there. But wow. everything else, you know, the walls were white, the floor was black, everything on the walls or on pedestals was black and white. So that was really, I loved it. That was my high point of this year, that oh, show. Man. That, that, that <laughs> sounds so experiential. Well, it's kind of it's kind of really cool because I'm also a photographer and I shoot exclusively in black and white. And I have this uh, mobile photography project called In the Sky. So all of the work um, is my interpretation of the tension between the ground and the sky. And I use different cities as muses for the project. I was just at London for the first time. I went to school in London in the 70s, and I haven't been back since a couple of weeks ago. And took some amazing photographs while I was there. So well, lots going on. <laughs> yeah, you've covered a lot, covered a lot. And, and uh, so I, I do want to take a, a quick commercial break. And when we come back, I want to dive into the topic. Um, and and uh, for Design Talk Live, each of our guests uh, bring the topic and then and then we we talk about that. So uh, when we come back from the break, we'll talk about specifying art in design projects and how designers can best work with art consultants and galleries. So I'm super excited to unpack that with you. So we'll be Great. right back after this quick commercial break. You could go to any tile store and buy a white or a beige tile any time of day. But we want to create something fun and unique for the client. At Alice Needham Studios, we custom create, design, and manufacture glass mosaic tiles. It was always clear to me that I would own my own business because I was unemployable. Um, I actually love doing my own thing. I really didn't want to listen or conform to what I was told to do. I run the production floor, and my husband, Gary, does all the business. Business, financial, Accounting, social media. I get to do the fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she started off with two employees. And now we're shipping to... Dubai, Macau, Jamaica. All over the world. We use the ink card every single day. We order all sorts of supplies, office supplies, shipping supplies. I really love the flexibility of the rewards points. We could redeem them for gift cards for our clients or for our employees. Or for me. <laughs> Allison is the one responsible for this artwork. It's really a reflection of her creativity, harnessing it all, putting it together, making it into a business. That's what we do every day. Hey guys, uh, welcome back to the show. Now I'm super excited uh, catching up with James. Again, uh, we've been following each other on social media, uh, we're probably missing each other uh, within design events. And uh, and so now we finally get to catch up and what, what a great uh, design art history uh, with the experience in London and Tribeca and San Francisco and now out in Palm Springs. Uh, James, uh, diving into the topic of specifying art, what 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 is it that people don't understand about specifying art for design projects? When you say what they don't understand, do you mean designers yeah. or? Yeah, what is something that uh, that in, in in you're working with designers? What is what is something that some people may not understand or may not know about specifying art? Um. I guess one of the largest reasons to specify art is financial. Um, designers can make a tremendous amount of money specifying art. The average um, gallery or art consultant trade discount to the design industry ranges from 10 to 20%. 20% is more of the norm. That's what I do. Strictly across the board, 20%. 
So um, I quote retail, I bill net less 20%. And I think any situation a designer walks into in terms of creating a space, be it residential, commercial, healthcare, um, resort, art is such an important thing. It's kind of like finishes or makes that final statement for a project. And I always encourage designers to specify art as a line item from the get-go. Because too often, if you wait till the end of a project, there's no money left. Hmm. So go at it right from the get-go. Um, I've worked with a number of great designers who will walk into their first presentation with a client with an image of a piece of art and say, this is like what I would like to use as the inspiration for this project. And it gets the client to begin thinking of art right from the get-go. Um, now, uh, and I'm going to guess you work with a lot of people who are collectors. Um, uh, it, and, and you've been uh, you know, in the art consulting space for a while now. What What is yes. some trends that you're seeing? Have you Is there peaks and valleys within the collecting space? Uh, is it pretty consistent? Uh, what, what, how has art collecting been? You know, art collecting is like, kind of like, I guess, anything else. The ultimate like facet of art collecting is when somebody just has full on passion for collecting art. They like can't see enough, they can't get enough. And collectors like there's all sorts of collectors. You know, even if a designer, for example, you know, gets a client and they walk into their home and they see art everywhere, and you know, come to learn that that client is a collector. That collector is always going to be open to seeing something new, something different. So, never dismiss, you know, that opportunity to place art with any level, be it a beginning collector, an established collector. Um, People who enjoy or are passionate about art are always open to looking at art. Now, uh, now, uh, I've been in uh, I've been in adult art school since elementary school, and uh, my my goal was to be an animator for Disney. Um, okay. Now, a lot of world renowned art, highly collectible, sought after art. Uh, is not actually on display. Uh, you had a lot of, you know, renowned art that's in art warehouses and stored properly. And um, oh yeah, how many times do you see a person who kind of comes in, they get the taste for, and then their collections they they uh, preserve them and build and start uh, acquiring a collection for either use or storage or preservation. That is like the top of the creme mountain. de la creme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I know of a couple of major collectors in New York who are buying warehouses in the Bushwick district of Brooklyn and building, you know, warehouses for their collections. Um, you know, one of the the perks, I guess, of when you're at that level of collecting that I very much like to see, I like to see these collectors donate work to um, one of my pet projects, which I've been involved with for over 20 years, is Art for AIDS in San Francisco. And they're a 25-year-old um 
event that every year they do this major auction, contemporary work. All of the work is donated by art collectors, by artists, um, goes up for auction, and the benefactor is the UCF, UCSF Alliance Health Project, which offers the San Francisco community free uh, mental health, um, housing, all kinds of services for people in the HIV community. Yeah. So when collectors will, you know, not be hoarders, but share what they're doing, you know, like loan pieces to museums, um, donate pieces for auctions that benefit people, all of that. You know, that's when you get up there, that's what I like to see. But the great I, thing is there were, you know, people who are down here who are doing those things as well. So, yeah, no, the um, I was just over I'm in Denver and I just a couple of weeks ago was over at the uh, Clifford Still Museum and mm -hmm. uh, Clifford Still uh, uh, 20th century artist, um, uh, abstract artist. Now, much of his work was never sold. Uh, and right. he had strict guidelines in his will and that his wife was, uh, uh, survived him and was the ex executor of it. They, uh, uh, Denver won the, uh, preservation contract and built the museum to warehouse his work there. Uh, so, but it was strict guidelines on restoration. Um, uh, uh, uh I'm always curious of that progression because I don't I don't know that people oftentimes understand the progression of that collector mentality where they go from liking a piece to buying a piece to then getting into the world of art to then mm -hmm. then uh, uh, collecting and 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 almost when you get a collector who starts to they they just fall in love with the with an artist and with their with their work they will then go from like display at home to almost this preservation mindset like this needs to be preserved and documented and then yeah. then that goes into like um donations to um and this is where philanthropy comes in and they start going you know donations to the city hospitals museums uh yeah. palm springs just has so many great museums built just purely around that of of all the collected works you know locally well, the Palm Springs Art Museum is like just such a great, unexpected museum for a city this size. You know, they have a great collection. They do wonderful exhibitions. They do so many great events there because there's a small theater in the museum. Um, you know, they have a great outdoor space where they do cocktail hours that coincide with other events, have DJs. So they're bringing a lot of, they're giving a lot to a lot of different audiences here. But, you know, back to what you were saying about um, the Clifford Still collection being preserved. You know, then you had, I can't think of their names, but the couple who were like, passionate Salvador Dali collectors who built and opened the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. Yeah. And what that museum, all it houses is their collection of Salvador Dali, which is, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's tremendous. From sketches to, you know, monumental paintings. And and that's where uh, art collecting really like you you you'll find a person who, you know they 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 dabbled and then they fell in love and then mm -hmm. they realize hey you know what this needs to be protected this needs to and and you get yeah. these people and they're kind of like the savior of a, a, a an art uh, and an artist um and and that's that's just phenomenal that that progression to me is always so phenomenal yeah. You know, you were talking about uh, 
Disney earlier, like those animation cells. I remember, especially in like the mid 80s, there was like a madness going on with collectors to collect those, the original cells, you know, like. Um, well, in the in the 80s, they were doing the, the uh, and I did a couple of murals at the animation studios in the, in the uh, late 80s. They um, they they tore down the old animation studios and they built the new animation wing with the big giant Mickey Mouse and Minnie Mouse and Donald Duck statues and the whole bit. It was <laughs> just a big project. And with that, a lot of those people were finding uh, boxes of animation cells in like dumpsters. Yes. I remember hearing about that. But, you know, (laughs) galleries were doing shows of them and selling them. They became hot auction items. So it's weird. I mean, that was like such a trend when you talk about trends at that time. But like today, I never hear of anybody collecting animation cells. Yeah. So yeah. things have their kind of time. I mean, look how long it took photography to become sort of acceptable as fine art. Yeah. yeah. And then it did. And then, you know, you started seeing like just tremendous, tremendous work. By, you know, everyone from Ansel Adams to Diane Arbus. Um, uh, uh, now, uh, kind of back towards your topic, how can designers best work with art consultants and galleries? What, uh, um, I, I'm from custom lighting, and, and I've okay. been surprised to find out how many uh, designers have not spec'd custom lighting. And and and, um, and and there's probably a huge swatch of designers who you, know, you shop from Left Bank and and some of the the art uh oh, um oh what are they West Cover and you know different art distributors and um but working with and and, and um uh, of the uh, sponsor of Design Talk Live back when we were uh, back in 2018 was fresh paint art out in LA. Uh, oh, and right. that was a I, design I consultant. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, but it, it's always interesting uh, how many people, how many designers uh, don't work with a uh, art consultant uh, yeah. or maybe haven't dip, dipped their toe in it. Uh, so how, how would a designer begin to work with you? So here's what I always recommend, you know, designers who aren't doing this, what they should do. They should get references from their designer friends of who those people are dealing with. Because take any city, there's a handful of art consultants. Everyone is a little bit different. Everyone sort of has a different reputation. So ask your colleagues who they're working with. My recommendation is always Find one art consultant and three galleries that you, you know, want to work with, that you like the aesthetic of what they're doing. That way you have a project. You call all three of the galleries and you call the art consultant and you say, this is the scope of the project. This is what I need. Can you put a presentation together for me? I mean, I, you know, have been doing this for so long that I have designers who don't do anything but call me and rely on what I'm going to do for them because they know what I will do for them. So, but when you collect from, say, three galleries and an art consultant, you're really presenting a tremendous sort of array to your client. And it really allows you to get a sense of what they're attracted to. Because you can't always take someone's word for what they like or don't like. I mean, 
I, I've often heard people say, I don't like abstract work, and I'll sell them three abstract works. <laughs> because there'll be something in that work that resonates for them. So um, now, that's, now what what I, that's, that's what I recommend. You know, you have your posse that you go to when you need art, just like, I, I don't know, I, I would imagine designers have a very small group of general contractors that they want to work with. They're not looking all over the place for general contractors. Every time they get a job, they go to their go-tos. And it's the same for art. You establish some go-tos and let these people work for you. I mean, because when you're specifying art, you know, there were so many levels of like collectors, like we were talking about earlier, that sometimes there's a lot of hand-holding and I step in and do that for them. So they don't have to kind of do anything other than present and connect. Uh, for example, if, you know, um, a designer shows one of my artists to a client and they respond to it and the client will say to the designer, tell me about the artist. They'll, I'll do that. You know, they don't need to take the time to learn about the artist, be able to converse about the artist, unless, of course, you know, they want to. Uh, for me, the pinnacle of when I'm doing a project is when the designer purchases for me for their collection. That's when I know, you know, that's what I love. Yeah. Now, uh, um now, I, I think also uh, I found that like with companies like Left Bank and things like that, it's great. It's ready. It's, uh, they can do re reproductions. and um, But also you can buy readily available art, but then you can also work with a consultant to work with an artist for commissioned art. And mm -hmm. that really takes your uh, design specification to that highly customizable and uh, in a collection, having specified, there are so many great works that are out there that were spec art. Commissions are a, a, an interesting um, <laughs> kind of, how do I describe a commission? They're tricky. They're really tricky because... You know, people have expectations. Not all um, clients are good candidates for commissions. The best people to do commissions with are people who've done commissions already, like with artists or with consultants. But if you've never done a commission before, it's a lot of hand-holding and dealing with people's expectations. And people should know that you have to give an artist some sort of room within the commission. You know, I mean, for me, when I want to like kind of take a knife <laughs> is when someone will say, do you have an artist who could copy this? Oh, no. And it's like, you know, <laughs> My answer always to that is no, I do not. Yeah. Um, you know, buy a reproduction if that's what you're looking for. But no, no I, I find that because, uh, um, again, my, I, I grew up, uh, uh, my focus was art. Later, I would get into custom lighting design, after that, into tech. And, and, uh, and I had commissioned art, and it was people that already bought my artwork and then liked that artwork and then yes. wanted something that wasn't just waiting to happen. They, they right. wanted some input. And so it was working collaboratively. Yes. So usually, was, And that's the best, yeah. you know, to bring the artist and the client together, a lot of conversation. Um, 
It, here, here's my favorite disaster commission story. Um, it was when I had a gallery in the East Village in New York. I had a group show up and there was one artist in the show whose work was like really kind of cool and flamboyant. And this couple walked into the gallery and they were like, oh, I love this artist's work. On and on and on and on. We just bought a house. We have this gigantic wall that we need a, a very specific size commission for. And it needs to be three paintings that work together. And it has a slanted ceiling. So they have to be sized appropriately and all of this. So we go out to the job site with the artist take all the specs, sizes, confer on everything. And the wife of the team says, I love absolutely everything you do, everything I've seen. I just want you to do anything you want to do. You see the space. Just let your mind dictate what you want it to be. The artist does the commission. We deliver the commission the first painting is coming off the truck and from a distance i could read the wife's lips which said it's so yellow oh. and we get to the door and she gasps and she said our designer told us no yellow and no orange well they never communicated that. Wow. And the artist took it so well that he actually changed the orange and the yellow in the paintings. And wow. they hated and they hated them. Oh no. So, so the paintings ended up in their garage. Wow. But that's the um flip side of a commission. Yeah. So the communication aspect of it is totally vital. Yeah. Again, unless, you know, the person wanting the commission, like you said, already has three of the artist's paintings. So they really, like, love the work. They're passionate about it. If the artist wants to take any kind of liberties, they almost welcome that. Yeah, yeah. So I... um. So I was a resident artist at Tuta Tango uh, at, at the um, at the Triangle in Orange County. It's an outdoor uh -huh. mall. And uh, so they had a bunch of resident artists, and you painted there, and then your art hung on the wall. Um, I went through this period of um, I liked painting uh, acrylic on mm -hmm. burlap, and I did African nudes. Okay. And, um so I, I have a piece up, and this piece uh, I'm working on it there, and uh, it was of a a mom with a baby, probably like an infant, sitting on her lap, and it had the beautiful bead work around the, mm -hmm. the the baby's collar and the mom. Um, uh, she was wearing a like a shawl, uh, but topless. Uh, I had gone on a break, and I I came back, and there was a a guy who was admiring the work and, and and then when i came up he was talking to me you know just admiring the the detail and the textures and and he loved that it was on burlap because it just felt very natural and and uh we're talking and and he's just gushing over this thing he's just a blast and so i picked up the paintbrush and i started to paint and he was like whoa 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 what are you doing <laughs> and uh he wasn't expecting me to be the artist <laughs> oh how funny <laughs> yeah yeah he was like what and i was like yeah, you know I, and i and i paint uh i i didn't paint i painted my style was uh realism mm -hmm. uh and i did not paint off of an image it was so it was purely out of my head and so okay yeah he 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 had a tough time with that and it was funny uh, <laughs> Um, we're going to take a, a quick commercial break. When we get back, I, I want to know kind of uh, the future of uh, art curation 
um, uh, art collecting and 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 art, given some interesting things like AI and and uh, trends, because definitely trends come into uh, specking uh, uh, artwork. So uh, we'll take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back. Hero Flooring was founded in 2014 with a clear focus on creating the ultimate client experience. Hero Flooring is a national brand of high performance floor coverings, which includes carpet in broad and carpet tile formats, Hero Rubber and Nike Grind, Tile, LVT, Engineered Wood, and Turf. Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we are in the final stretch of our interview with James. Uh, first of all, it's been so much fun uh, getting to uh, talk with you and and again we've been following each other on social media uh and and i love the progression of uh, of your journey within art uh and, and and i'm really curious to find out from you the future of uh, uh out here in denver we've got the the rhino arts district and i'll tell uh-huh. you we only have one more we only have one art gallery left um the um Santa Fe Arts District is picking up steam. There's a lot of new builds and uh, mid rises coming in, and so there's a lot of new, uh, you know, uh, vitality in the area. Um, where are you seeing? Where are you seeing the current status of the art industry, and where do you see it going? In all honesty, as hard as this is to say, I see it going in the metaverse. Yeah. Um, there is so many interesting projects, art projects going on there. Um, I guess, I guess I'll say it anyway. I mean, I'm at the very beginning stages, um, of creating something in the metaverse with a really special person, Suse Green, who is a, singer songwriter artist she was the last supreme oh wow yeah and you know she's she's just this amazing amazing talent and we're uh, creating a gallery in the metaverse and doing a two-person show of our work to open it with so that's why uh, because there's so much great existing art, mm-hmm. uh, there are so many that every generation has has. If they're not recognized in the moment, uh, every generation puts out a creative thinker and an innovator within the art space, from m- mixed media to your know, your classic oils and um, and your advancements in materials. And there has been a push to digital, but do you, you so you're you're seeing kind of a, 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 a clear movement into digital, huh? Very much so. I mean, I think there's never been an alternative that could assist so many artists in getting their work out there. You know, I mean, that concept of getting a gallery show, you know, there's 400 galleries and there's 4 million artists. So the, yeah, I just see that that is going to really, really like almost eclipse, you know, because I have a gallery and because I'm a photographer and have two different social media platforms, one for the gallery, one for my work, I must get 10 to 15 inquiries a day on each of my sites asking if I would consider selling this art as NFTs, Mm -hmm. which I, at this point, I continue to say no to other than, um, the Joshua Tree Museum asked, actually has a NFT museum within their museum. 
Oh, wow. So they have four of my photographs in the NFT museum. That's as far as I've gotten. Um, I I just think it's it's really going to explode. Oh, and I think to like to completely stay away from it is, you know, not the way to go. I, I'm open. I'm keeping a really open mind to it. Yeah. And I'm one of these old school people. So technical <laughs> stuff, like, you know, just to go into the metaverse is a trip for me. Yeah. I mean, but that's art. Art, art was, is always push boundaries. That's what it, that's the, that's yes. the core of art. Yeah. Uh, so I totally get the, the new, and, and to be fair, a photography was photography. And then along came digital and, and seeing, photography on a digital screen with your advancement and um you know lcd and and just great pixel rates i mean your iphone has such clarity now that like it almost it just feels good seeing things in digital um what are your thoughts on uh 3d 3d uh scanning 3d reproduction it's all good you know, it's not it's not something I'm connected to because again, uh -huh. that's way too technical for me. Um, but you know, back to the whole digital thing, now it had to be 12 years ago. Um, my gallery in San Francisco, we hosted the first international mobile photography awards exhibition. Oh, wow. And that was the catalyst for me to become a photographer because this exhibition were the winners of this, again, international jury thing where they got over 14,000 submissions from all over the world. And to see what could be created with the phone. And that was part of the stipulation of your entries. Everything you did could only be created within the phone. And I remember there was this one artist who was one of the winners. His name is Shane Robinson. And he had a photograph in the show that utilized 14 apps oh, wow. to create his piece all created in the phone and that like opened up an entire new world for me and i have such great respect for it so oh, yeah. that was something in my mind like that you know totally like that technology spurring a new art form i uh, um and here it comes again <laughs> in the with, metaverse with design talk live, I started producing other shows like Jennifer Farrell's design hot seat and uh, Talia Maddox. Let's talk breast health and a student's perspective back in uh, 2019. And uh, I'll tell you, I had a $16,000 red camera and I was using Elgato relays and, and all this stuff uh, gave it a little bit of time. And by 20, 2020 um, I switched to all cell phones. I, 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 I showed up to an event in um, uh, at the Mandalay Bay. I was doing a virtual event, and the show manager, the operations director, uh, said, "Hey, we didn't receive in your equipment. Um, you know, so uh, <laughs> I don't know where your equipment's at." And I was like, oh, "I'm wearing it in my backpack." And she Here was it like, is. "Yeah." She was like, "Hold, uh, hold on. Uh, you're you're doing the entire digital virtual show." Um, are you going to be able to do this? And, um, we had the whole, whole thing delivered within an hour of the show ending. Like we were, uh, everything was wrapped up and published within an hour. And she was right. like, holy cow. And I was like, yeah, mobile. I do all my, my editing yeah. and I do everything on my cell phone and tablet. Well, prior to, you know, phone photography, Look what we were missing. 
in terms yeah. of being able to capture something. Yeah. That to me is like the the crazy, crazy good part about it. That oh my god, look at that. Like I was sitting in my living room the other day looking into the backyard and walking across the top of the wall was a road run. Now, without my phone, I would never have been able to capture that. Yeah. So that whole part about it is, oh, my God, it's such like immediate art gratification. <laughs> it doesn't get better than that. And and it is a tool. It is a tool, and you can yeah. you can download different apps, and you can set the pro settings, and you can get into your. Oh yeah, it's it, it's the optics on it are amazing. Yeah. Um, so so then, in your opinion, uh, for uh, on the on the interior design side, uh, how what's the future like for them and and. Uh, working with an art consultant and and the future of art for designers i i kind of see like trends in art getting more away from tradition and more into people are now like really opening up to more installation kind of pieces and you know like backing away from the traditional framed painting over the sofa and just like wanting to like get a little edgier. And I like that because that's how I, that's what attracts me in collecting. Like, you know, I, I, I like, I've always, the two things that I've always responded to in art was one, like, technical proficiency coupled with some sort of a twist like bend the rule or there's got to be something in there like maybe something that has a little bit of a sense of humor or just some kind of twist but the technical part of it has to be over the top so they had the Van Gogh um, immersive experience, um, and, and, and to be fair, and I'm uh, people, I may lose some listeners on this one, but I wasn't <laughs> impressed. Um, I I didn't see it because I felt like I would not be impressed. It it, it, it felt like projectors on a wall. Uh, yeah, it, I wanted for an immersive. I wanted 3D. I wanted smells. I wanted yes. you know, taste. Yes. I wanted to feel like I was immersed. Right. And what I got was surround projectors. Like it, yeah. it, it just wasn't for me. I, I didn't get now. I'm a person who, uh, and I just recorded another uh, podcast episode just a little, a, a couple hours ago. Um, I, when I cook, I like to throw on some jazz music. I don't have a TV. I have a projector. Mm -hmm. um, and so all, Shine the projector at the wall. I'll throw on a black and white. Uh, I'll hook and listen to jazz. And 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 because I'm not on a traditional TV, my whole wall can become a TV. Uh, right. Then I feel more immersed. And and I'm curious to see as the world goes into more of this, you know, through AI and this, the, we start to think more immersive. I'm curious if our walls, and I, I thought this was going to happen with OLED. Uh, I thought we were going to be able to turn our walls into screens, and and now you could live in a in an immersive space. Um, and I still think we can. I, I think we can start to appreciate art in a whole different realm. The curiosity is going to be monetizing. Yes, I agree. And that metaverse that's kind of, you can control some of that. Um, digital became weird. It, became, it started to raise that question. Immersive experiences, uh, the, you know, and, and this is where blockchain and tokenization and all this stuff starts to come in and saying like, well, how do you make sure that the artist still gets their cut? And how does the resale market get their cut? Um, and, and I think it's a whole forefront. It's a whole forefront. Oh, but I think totally. And think of, you know, 
It's like a whole new forefront for lawyers. <laughs> you know, oh, the lawyers always come out ahead of right. you. <laughs> but yeah, it's just, I don't know. It's all kind of, you know, but like what you said about the Van Gogh immersive thing, if you're going to do something like that, you need to take it so far over the top that, you know, you're going to leave people with their mouths dropped. Yeah. If not, why bother? You know, I'd yeah. rather go. I'd rather go see a traditional Van Gogh show in a museum than to have a, a letdown experience like that. Uh, years ago, years ago, and it was way too too early. Um, I had a, a talk with Steve Wynn um, out in out in Irvine. They they were putting up the. Um, uh, what are those? The the hangars out at the the old uh, uh, Air Force Base. Uh, mm-hmm. They they had come up and and they were available to purchase. You can purchase that. Um, and so I'd gone to Steve and I would pitched. Uh, what I wanted to do was I didn't want to change any of the outside. So it's just a, a parking lot with old rickety signs and nothing nothing new. No change to the exterior of the hangar. But when you walked in the door, when you opened up the door and you stepped in, I wanted a full recreation of Bourbon Street. I wanted the swamp smell and the musty smell of Uh wood. (laughs) Kind of like Pirates of the Caribbean, like fully immersive. Like, yeah, because I wanted I wanted that um, where I was in Irvine, California, and with one step, I stepped into Bourbon Street. Right. Um, and, and unless it's pirates of the Caribbean style immersive, like, you know, um, and I think that that's where, uh, uh, virtual is trying to go. I still question the smells and the rest of the stuff and, you know, yeah. but, um, or people walking around with Oculus glasses on. Like I, I still, I think we're a ways away, but, um, but it, it, it's interesting, and I do like that blockchain. And with NFT, people got really stuck on the, the yacht monkeys. Um, but it, 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 it isn't that. At the, in, the NFT is the contract part of it. And then yeah. That has a lot of application. Well, I'm, uh, I'm super excited. Where can people learn more about the, um, the, your, your um, NFT and your immersive experience or your um, – where that, that, it's going to be um, on spatial. Okay. Are you familiar with them? I am not. Oh, uh, Google them. Okay. Yeah. Um, these are a group of like, again, you know, tech wizards who are creating all these different sort of spaces in the metaverse from galleries to buildings and you know why i know this is kind of like the next big thing is look at the companies who are getting involved in this like who was it was it one of the super high-end car companies introduced their entire 24 2024 line of cars in the metaverse fashion companies but i'm talking major major brands are all going to the metaverse so there's something there (laughs) you know it's like um star trek (laughs) you know what that was back in the day well this is it now but like everyone can become a part of it yeah so it's scary it's you know there are people who like say eh, eh." no it's it's there and it's like um it's gonna explode i know it is james if you could give designers uh i don't know a, a couple of tips on how to work with an art consultant uh what are What are a couple of tips that you would give a designer? Um, 
let the art consultant really work for you. And you, the designer needs to be kind of as thrilled as the client because, you know, the designer's name is on it. I mean, I, I always say this to, like, designers that I can say this to. Nothing must be more disappointing than you do this amazing, amazing project and the client, like, you know, hangs their bad art, like, on the walls. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, most of them, what they'll do is they'll bring in art for the photo shoot. And oftentimes, you know, oftentimes, like, that's a really good thing to do because I can't tell you how many times I've done that with designers. Like, they'll say, can I borrow art for a photo shoot? And the client ends up buying it because my aesthetic combined with the designer's aesthetic, we come up with something that just takes what the designer's already done to the next level. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, that's the best advice I can give. And work with an art consultant that gets what you're doing as a designer and appreciates what you're doing. You know, for me, like, again, I've worked with so many designers for so long from, you know, old school greats to up and coming. And nothing thrills me more. And I, I can honestly say there's not a lot of designers that I put into this category where every project I see that they do doesn't resemble the last thing that they did in any way, shape, or form. Because I remember for a long time, like in the late 90s and at that period in particular, Designers were, you know, almost coming up with a style and just kept replicating it. Mm -hmm. Much like there were artists who do that as well. You know, they just like do some variation of the same thing over and over and over again. But when a designer like just, you know, gives you something completely new and fresh every time they do something, um, I mean, one did, you know, there's, of course, there's Kelly Wurstler, who just keeps going over the top and over the top. And that's kind of what I would say is on the grand scale of design. Um, one designer that I work with over and over again that I just have tremendous respect for is Lizette Marie Bruckstein, Lizette Marie Interior Design. Um I worked with her on her room in the San Francisco Decorator Showcase this past year. And it was like the gentleman's corporate office at home. And it was just, it was like every single piece of anything in this space was so carefully chosen. We even did some commission art pieces. And I mean, her room just got so much press. And, you know, you can't get that from just anybody, like from a designer or from a consultant, like that would get that excited about that particular project and like, okay, let, we could do this, we could do that. Um, you know, there were very specific artists that I represent that she loves and we went to them and they stretched and you know that that's when things are just where they need to be so yeah i mean go with an art consultant that you have to you have to have that synergy with that understands what you're doing and they understand it yeah yeah the great tips i uh, uh, art uh, design is art, and and sometimes you know, if I'd been an animator for Disney, I would have been working an hourly job. It wouldn't have had the same creativity as 
the the artwork I did at Two to Tango, or where it was just art because I loved art, and I painted on burlap because I liked the rawness of it. Uh, Do you have images of any of those pieces? So I don't. I mean, uh, I would love to see them at some point. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, um, I, I moved here with two backpacks. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I am not. When I leave Denver, I will pack two backpacks and leave. Like I am, oh. I'm a minimalist. So I unfortunately did not keep, do not keep anything. Um, well, do that and come to Palm Springs. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have. Yeah, I've got to get back into art. It was it was a, such a fun, creative expression, uh, and and I and I had a lot of fun with it. James, uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, we normally I do these in fifteen minute blocks, but uh, I think we we've blown past that. Um, uh, I've had a really good time, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, h- how can people find out more about you and and begin to work with you? Um, easiest way to contact me is and get a sense of what I do is go on my website. It's uh, jamesbocchicontemporary.com. Right. Well, you'll James, find my contact info and you'll get a real sense of the art I represent, the projects I work on, who I work with. And then, and then, uh, as a reminder, where was that the um, the virtual event or the um, where can people find out more about the? Um... Well, they can't at this point. Okay, so they have to go to the website. <laughs> That's still going. Okay, okay. That's still being all kind of put together. Okay, but so we'll do yeah. a big, you know, unleashing when the time is right. Okay, and then and will the, where can people get updates on that uh, on your website or your email? Um, yeah, pretty much on my Instagram. Okay, right, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, follow along because that that sounds interesting. You, you, uh, you, again, your career has expanded and you've touched on so many different things with, uh, and so yeah, definitely follow along. Go to the website, go to the Instagram, follow along. And James, it's been a pleasure having you on. Oh, thank you so much, Joseph. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Design Talk Live podcast. The Design Talk Live podcast is produced by the Live Broadcast Network, Joseph Hecker, Inc., and Design Talk Live Studios. This episode was produced by Eric Miller. The theme song for our show is Cielo and is used under a Creative Commons license. Editing was done by Greg Stevens. Mixing and mastering by Melanie Kim. To be a guest on the show or to become a sponsor, please visit us at josephhecker.com slash design talk live. That's josephhecker.com slash design talk live. Until next time, say hi to someone new. You never know who you'll meet. Look, mom, I made that.